following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today we're going to continue our talk about the three brains. So we're going to be discussing some basic factors in Gnostic psychology and essential information that the Gnostic student needs to understand in order to really apply this teaching. Gnosis is, in its heart, a form of practical knowledge. And what that means is that it's not limited to merely a concept or an idea. It's a form of knowledge that has to be applied. It has to be used and worked with in oneself. And this is something that is not easy to accomplish. It requires a great deal of discipline and a great deal of energy. And perhaps even more than that, it takes sincerity. Sincerity is a virtue, a quality that has to be developed. And to be sincere means to be true, to be truthful, to be honest. Someone who's insincere feels one thing and says another, or knows one thing and does another. And that's the definition of insincerity, if you look it up in the dictionary. So in that sense, you could say that Gnosis is really the path to achieve true sincerity. It's a means and a method and a practical tool that one uses in order to achieve real sincerity, which is also the same thing as integrity, or to have an integral consciousness, unity, or what we would call in Gnosis, real individuality to be a real individual. So today's lecture is called, it's a rather long title, The Erroneous, if I can even spell it, Functioning of the Five Centers. When you study Gnosis, you'll hear a lot about the three brains. The three brains are machines that we have in our psychology. We break those down as the intellect or the intellectual brain, the emotion or the emotional brain, and the motor instinctive sexual brain, which has three parts. Each of these three are a kind of machine which function in a specific way. Each one has its particular functions, its particular capabilities, and limitations. And each one of them is a sort of device or engine that can be used by any form of consciousness that we have. It's important to understand that clearly. Because as a machine, it has a particular function, but it can be used by different drivers or different users. 
different people can get into a car and drive that car and go to all kinds of places. And each driver will have their own will, their own intentions, their own ideas. Now, in Gnosis, those drivers can be our own egos. Egos that we would call pride or fear or vanity or shame. The driver can also be the being who is that divinity within us. So the job of the Gnostic student becomes making sure to only let the right driver behind the wheel, to use the machine of our human organism, of our human consciousness. So we group that machine, the human machine, according to three aspects. But we also can break that down further and look at the parts of that machine. And that's why we call it the five centers. Because those three brains are really much more sophisticated than a simple uh, analogy of three. That machine, the human machine, breaks down into a lot of different parts, each of which has their own functions. In the same way you look at the engine of a car, it is an engine which we call this uh, collection of parts. But all of the parts in that engine each have their own purpose. And even more, each one requires different types of energy or different types of fuel or different fluids in order for them to function properly. So when we examine our own psychology, it's very important for us to look at how to use that machine in the right way. And in Gnosis, we hear about this phrase, which is our cosmic duty, or what in some cases is called the parlock duty of the being. Parlock, the way we normally spell it, is P-A-R-L-O-K. In the tradition of Gurdjieff, it's spelled P-A-T-L-O-D-G, or something like that. That term, according to what I've been able to find out so far, is really a derivative of either Tibetan or Mongolian term. I don't have any uh, real details about it yet. But since Gurdjieff traveled in that area of the world and got his teachings there, we can assume probably pretty safely that that's where that word is coming from. The teaching behind this, Parlock duty, is that we have a certain responsibility. We have a cosmic duty, which transcends the limitations of our physical life. Sorry, I know that window's loud. Let me close that. This cosmic duty has five aspects. And about this, the Master Samael Anvior says, the first aspect is to not allow intellectual concepts to pass through our mind in a mechanical way. And what this means is that we have to become conscious, or in other words, aware, of the functioning of our own intellectual center, which means where our thoughts occur in the mind. We have to process all the data or information that passes through the intellect in a conscious way. And the more you study Gnostic psychology, the more you understand that we do not do this normally. The second aspect is that we have to become conscious of all the activities of our emotional center. And he says, it is lamentable to see how people are moved by the impulses of the emotional center in a completely mechanical form without any control. And what we understand from that is that we typically are being motivated and moved by emotions, by feelings. And we react to that and act basically on a kind of emotional impulse without any real conscious control. 
An example would be someone criticizes us, we automatically react with feelings that are hurt. And so we instantly and mechanically form a form a kind of reaction or an action in response. And that may be vengeance, it may be resentment, it may be self-hate. But that is a mechanical process and has nothing to do with the divinity inside of us. It has nothing to do with the being. The third part of our cosmic duty is related to the motor center. The motor center is located at the top of the spinal column. The motor center is where we have our habits and customs. This is where we have acquired activities or activities that we learn with the physical body. This includes things like learning to ride a bicycle, learning to walk, learning to run. These are activities of the motor center. But we tend to act mechanically in the motor center, and we need to become conscious of all of our movements, all of our habits, and all the functions of the physical body that we're aware of at this level in the motor center. And the fourth aspect of our cosmic duty is to be owners of our own instinct, which means we have to understand and comprehend and consciously manage the instincts of the physical body, which is not an easy task. And the fifth is related to the sexual center. And the cosmic duty of the being related to the sexual center is to use the sexual energy in a conscious and potent way with willpower, to not be a mechanical and unconscious person driven by sexual impulse, but to have conscious responsibility related to the sexual energy. So those five aspects of our cosmic duty are obviously related to our five centers. Going further, we understand that when we study this cosmic duty, we can see very clearly that we're not doing it. Because when we are sincere with ourselves, meaning we're honest, we're not hiding something from ourselves, then we can see very clearly that we're acting mechanically in all five centers all the time. We have thoughts that are occurring and processing mechanically constantly. And as new information is coming into us from our environment, we are reacting to that mechanically on a continual basis, not merely with thoughts, but with feelings and with impulses, physically. And that is the root or the core of Gnostic psychology, is learning how to perform our cosmic duty by learning how to manage the human machine. And this human machine, of course, has these five parts, or five centers. Now, in order for us to really understand that, it's important that we understand who the being is. What we call in Gnosis the being, some religions might call God. Some might call the inner Buddha. Or they might call it the inner Christ, or our inner angel, or our real self. In truth, these are terms which have no real relationship with what the being actually is. The being is what the word implies. An energy that is present and active. When one is being, one exists, but in an active way. This isn't something passive or conceptual. This is something energetic, which is not trapped in time. And that's a very important thing to begin to see. Time has nothing to do with the being. And so it's a grave misconception to believe that in time, we will come to know who our being is. Because time has nothing to do with it. The being is. 
But we are trapped in time. And that's because of the wrong functioning of our psyche. How to manage the five centers properly with conscious will. Then we, at the same time, are learning how to be. To be present. To be active as a consciousness. And that's something very profound and something that cannot be written or even explained. It has to be something that we live, something that we know through action in ourselves. And one can only discover that in oneself. It can't be done for you. It cannot be transmitted. It can't be passed on or explained or given as a gift. It's something that one has to activate by one's own effort. The means to arrive at that kind of knowledge or gnosis is by learning about oneself. Through observing oneself, by getting to know the five centers, one learns how the psyche works and how to manage that psyche. And in that process, one begins to grasp that we are trapped or caught within a lot of different competing desires. And in Gnosis, we call them eyes, or egos, which is Latin for I. Because each one of these aggregates, or defects, has its own will. It has its own identity. It has its own way of seeing and thinking and feeling and acting. So any given I has three brains, in that sense. Or you could say, any given eye uses the three brains. And we say that because a particular desire, any kind of desire, has its own thoughts, which will process through our intellectual center. Any desire has its own feelings, which will process through our emotional center. And any desire has its own will, or its own intentions to act, which will process through the motor, instinctive, and sexual centers. This has to be something that we find in ourselves and can see it. And it doesn't take long to verify that if one is sincerely observing oneself. As an example, if you are insulted, if you are criticized, new feelings arise, new thoughts arise, new sensations arise. A whole new person shows up inside of you, which is anger or shame. And that new person inside of you has new thoughts or different thoughts from what were there before the criticism arrived. And new feelings arise that are different from what was there before the criticism was there. And also impulses to act or will to behave in a certain way. So if it's anger that comes as a result of criticism, we will think, how can they say that to me? It's not true. And we will feel hurt. And we will feel enraged. And we will feel wronged and betrayed. And as a sensation, as will, we may feel the urge to avoid the situation completely to abandon that person, to shut them out of our life. Or we may feel the urge for revenge, to get them back, to confront them. It depends on our personality, it depends on our temperament, and it depends on that ego. So each of those eyes is a person, having its own thoughts and feelings and intentions. That's why we say we have no real individuality. Because we have so many different eyes or competing wills that we do not have singular will. We do not have an intention 
that is consistent and that can weather any storm. The one who has that is the being. And when we unite ourselves with him, we begin to understand what that really means. To have real will. To have real willpower. Which does not contradict itself from one minute to the next. This is something that we have to really meditate on in order to comprehend. Because it's very deep. The root of this is, obviously, in how we work with our own psyche. To comprehend the nature of individuality, the nature of the ego, the nature of the being, we have to observe ourselves and we have to meditate. To meditate means to abandon the processes of the mind and to use the consciousness free of ego or free of any I in order to perceive the truth. Any I is actually a lie. Every I is a liar. And so long as we are encased inside any ego, we do not see the truth. On a superficial level, this is relatively easy to see when we have anger, when we have fear, when we have pride. Because these color or qualify our vision. They filter it. So we no longer see things as they are. And you may see this in yourself when you pass through a difficult situation and then sometime later you look back and realize how mistaken you were with the way you were seeing it at the time. Hindsight is twenty twenty, right? We have to develop that vision during those difficult times to be able to see objectively without the influence of our own pride or our shame or our fear or our gluttony. Developing that vision comes when we understand exactly how the five centers work in ourselves. When we understand why we suffer. Have we ever really considered that question? Why do I suffer? And when we consider that question, who answers it? Is it your own mind? Or is it your being? When you ask yourself the question, why do I suffer? Be sincere. Because if you justify yourself, if you blame others, if you wash your hands of any wrongdoing, it is not your being. We suffer because of our own actions. We suffer because we allow our own thoughts and our own emotions to interfere with our lives. To be more specific, we allow the thoughts and emotions of the ego to interfere with our lives. And that's because we still do not grasp the difference between the being, the consciousness, and the ego. We don't see that. And we don't see that because we don't observe ourselves. To observe ourselves is to use the consciousness. To use it in an active and direct way. To be attentive. Consciousness is attention. In Sanskrit, the word for consciousness is vijana, which has two parts. The first part is vi, which is related to vision or insight. The second part is jnana, which is knowledge. So it's the vision through knowledge, or the knowledge you gather through vision. 
That's the beauty of Sanskrit. Those components have different meanings. So consciousness, or vijana, is how we perceive without ego if it's free. But if that vijana or that consciousness is trapped in ego, then that knowledge becomes filtered. And that information that we gather is filtered. It's no longer objective. It becomes subjective, or rather a false piece of data or datum. It's false knowledge. When we really sincerely and honestly look at the entire view or panorama of our life, and back even further, we look at the panorama of this entire humanity, we find that all of the sufferings of humanity in our own personal lives and in all the lives of all the other billions of creatures who call themselves human beings, all of their suffering is because they do not understand what the consciousness is, what the being is. And if that understanding were there, we would not hurt each other. We would not punish each other. We would not seek revenge. We would not try to attack. We would not feel resentment. There would be no wars. There would be no starvation, no rape, no murder. Consciousness is the beauty and light of the being. But when that consciousness becomes trapped in an ego, that ego controls the five centers which causes us to perform wrong action. And when we use any of the five centers through the ego, we acquire results or consequences for those actions. And in other terms, it's called karma. Unfortunately, when we answer that question for ourselves, about suffering, we blame our circumstances. We say, I suffer because of my problems. Because I have problems in my marriage. Because I have problems with my family. Because I'm not doing enough to help other people. And I see other people suffering around me. And I'm failing to do that. To give them what they need. And so I'm suffering because of that. Or I'm suffering because of my job. My job's too hard, too demanding. Or I suffer because of where I live. Or because I don't have enough money. All of that is a lie. It's insincere. It's a lie because we suffer because of who we are not because of where we are. If I had no pride, I would not suffer if you criticized me. I wouldn't care. If I had no fear, why would I worry about poverty? Why would I worry about anything if there were no fear in me? If I had no envy, why would I try to corrupt or to have revenge against my friends or my family? If I had no jealousy, why would I feel hurt for the friends that my spouse has or the love that my spouse has? All suffering is rooted in our own mind without exception. The Buddha said, Our minds create our lives. We become what we think. Just as a cart follows a horse, so suffering follows wrong thinking. And just as a cart follows a horse, bliss and nirvana follow right thinking. 
We have to look for the answers for suffering within our own minds, within our own hearts, and with our own actions. You can work for the next 30 years to change your external circumstances, but you will still suffer. You can compete with Donald Trump and try to knock him off his throne, but you will still suffer. You can try to become the most educated person that exists on the face of the earth, and you will still suffer. Suffering is removed when the ego is removed. When the ego is no longer there, what remains is the being. And the being is. And that is, that being, is perfect happiness, which is unfiltered, without limitation. beyond anything our mind can even conceive of. And yet we ignore that because we're trapped in desire. So we start by learning how these five centers work. In the intellect, we have what we call thoughts. Thoughts are not vague empty forms. They are a form of matter. They have a concrete reality, although we only perceive a certain aspect of that while we're here in the physical world. But thoughts are real because we have them. We sense them. We know they're there. But where are they? Thoughts are not limited to the physical brain. Thoughts are a product and process of the mental body, which is another aspect of our own psyche. The mental body is a form of energy and matter which processes what we call thoughts. And those thoughts arrive in our intellectual center and process there in what we experience as thinking. The proper use of that center is difficult to achieve. We tend to misconceive the functioning of the intellect. We confuse two very important terms. What we think is not necessarily intelligent. What we think of now as mind or as our real self is really a stream of thinking. It's just thoughts. And we're always trying to build that capacity, the power of thought or the power of mind. And there's thousands of books written about mind control and mind power. And this relates to also trying to develop a very Uh, robust intellectual understanding of things or intellectual knowledge. So people memorize books. They memorize information. They study a lot of different things in order to build that because they feel that that's what life is for. This is merely intellectualism. And all intellectualism is is a way of playing with data or playing with concepts. That's all. Intellectual, in, intellectualism is really just the battle between thesis and antithesis or antithesis. It's the battle between yes and no. And let me tell you, if you haven't already discovered it, no matter how perfect your intellectual concept may be, there will always be an opposing concept, which is just as brilliant. So no matter how strongly you develop your intellectual brain, it will always be contradicted. 
And the reason is because it's a simple machine. That's all it is. It's just a machine. It's a machine that works in duality. Yes, no. Positive, negative. Good, bad. That's all. It's a machine that has a particular function, which is to receive and transmit intellectual data, ideas, concepts. But intellectualism has nothing to do with intelligence. Intelligence is the capacity of the being. Intelligence is conscious knowledge. But it's not limited to conceptual or theoretical knowledge. It's a kind of knowledge that's beyond the capacity of the intellect, strictly speaking. The word intelligence in Hebrew is bina. Bina is the third sphere the top triangle of the tree of life. And Bina is related to the Holy Spirit. In Hinduism, that's called Shiva. That intelligence is the fire which creates life. It's a kind of knowledge or understanding which is so profound and so deep that our own mind, our own brain can't even begin to understand what it is. The only way for us to really access that intelligence is if we are a good servant of our own being, meaning we have the vehicle to receive that kind of knowledge. We could say that the intellect is like the engine of a little remote control car, the intellectual center on its own is a small engine. So it has a certain capacity, no more. Intelligence is like the power of the sun. Now, how can the little engine of a remote control car compare to the power of the sun? There's no comparison. And yet, if you build the proper kind of device between the two, that little car can use the power of the sun. Right? It can harness it. It can be driven by it. But only if the right device is there. And notice that device is called the solar mental body. And that device must be created through using the right functioning of the five centers. It becomes necessary then for us to understand the difference between intellectualism and intelligence because that pure intelligence can still arrive in us through intuition, through visions, through subtle understandings which come through the consciousness Little hints, little comprehension, little understanding. That knowledge can arrive inside of us if we use the consciousness in the right way and if the consciousness is managing the function of the intellectual center. How do you do that? Simple. Don't let the ego use the intellect. When you have thoughts arising, separate from those thoughts. Observe them. Don't act on them all the time. Doubt them. Question them. Investigate them. Find out where they come from. What are they driven by? If you have thoughts arising in your intellect, watch your heart too. If you're feeling some discomfort emotionally, your thoughts are probably driven by that emotion. If you're frustrated, your thinking may be driven by that frustration. 
That's not coming from the being. That's not real intelligence. If you're examining a problem at work, you've got a difficult situation that you're facing, and you feel frustrated, and you feel a little angry, how is your being going to give you the right answer to your problem? He can't, because you are allowing that ego of anger and frustration to control the five centers. And these five centers are vibrating with the energy of that desire, which is anger. So if those five centers are already have a driver in the seat, the being can't get in the car. That car is already going, and it's going wherever that anger wants it to go, and we as a consciousness are allowing that, because it feels normal. Because we agree with the anger. And that's our problem. We have to self-criticize. Not to be cruel. Not to punish ourselves. But to control our own mind. We have to be clear. Who are we allowing to drive our own machine? Who's in control from moment to moment? Everyone is seated, relaxed, and listening, hopefully. But are you daydreaming also? Are you thinking about something else? Are you remembering yesterday or last week? Are you thinking about a problem? Are you imagining tomorrow? Are you fantasizing about having a mental body? Then you've got egos that are fighting to control your machine. Egos of desire, pride, envy, jealousy. It takes conscious willpower to establish moment-to-moment control of the five centers. Observing the emotional center, we see that we have feelings. All kinds of feelings that arise and pass through the course of a day, even the course of an hour. It can be such a variety of things that we feel. And some people believe that emotion is driven by God. Some schools and some religions believe that whatever we feel emotionally is good. Some schools and religions teach that we should express our anger. That we should express our pride. We should be proud of our race, of our religion, of our culture. Some teach these things, but they don't teach what the being is nor the ego. Emotion is a very powerful force. It's a very potent kind of energy which drives the vehicle in its own way. To control the impulses of the emotional center is very difficult. It's when our heart is vibrating with a strong feeling It's very hard to go against that, to control that. And we all have our particular weaknesses in that area. What we have to realize, though, is there is yet again another form of duality in the emotional center. Emotions can be positive or negative, for or against. We have love and hate. We have avarice and generosity. We have lots of different emotional qualities that we pass through that are a kind of duality in the emotional center. But what we need to clearly understand here is that there are negative emotions and positive emotions. 
we call a negative emotion any emotional state that is produced by an ego. It might feel really good, but it's still negative. When we're praised and admired and envied, we love that feeling. It feels really good when everybody likes us. But that is a negative emotion because it's pride. And in that praise we're receiving, there's no recognition of the being. It's all about me. It's all about myself. I. That is a negative emotion. When we see a movie or TV and we watch a romantic episode and we feel very inspired with the romantic feelings that we observe and become identified with, that is a negative emotion. It's a form of desire in the heart. There are positive emotions also. Positive emotions related to the being, such as spiritual longing or a spiritual anxiety, which can actually feel quite painful. But that is a positive emotion because that's a quality of the consciousness, of the being who's ringing on the bell of the heart for us to wake up. That longing, that pain is beautiful even though it hurts. Our tendency is to avoid that. Rather than trying to find the right antidote for that spiritual emptiness, we seek to obliterate it with lust by trying to cover it with desire or passion for another person. Because we mistake our spiritual loneliness for an emotional need that we will satisfy through another person or through masturbation, something like that. And that's a crime. Or we seek to fill that spiritual void by switching centers and filling the mind with intellectual information. Or we listen to music so we can become happy. We try to do something in order to change the vibration of our heart but in a negative way. And that's unfortunate. The spiritual longing and spiritual anxiety is the being calling us, crying out for us to return, to know him, to know her. We need that. Rather than getting ourselves identified with the praise of others, with fitting in with society, with being admired, with having all the toys that we want, or completing our CD collection, because that'll make us feel really good. Those are emotional things. Or trying to get a better spouse, because we don't feel satisfied emotionally. What we need to understand is that emotional satisfaction and emotional equilibrium only comes from the being. And it comes through work. What I'm trying to express to you is the difference between mechanical suffering and voluntary suffering. All of the emotions that we know now, well, let's, let's not say all, let's say 97%. 97% of the emotions that we know now are emotions that the ego produces in us, meaning that they're all negative emotions. And every one of them is a form of suffering, even those that feel good. They're a form of suffering because they separate us from our real identity, from the being. 
They are all what we call mechanical suffering. Because those qualities, those states, those emotions are a result of karma. The karma of having an ego and the karma of having produced wrong action. So we suffer from the results of that. Moreover, we become identified with those emotions. We revel in them. We think they are who we are. Many people are so absorbed in their emotional experiences that they totally ignore the other centers. Artists, actors, sensitive people in that way become so fascinated and identified with emotion. But it's really negative emotion. Even what they call love is really just attachment. For most people, love is simply desire masquerading under another name. Because real love is a quality of the being. And the being has no attachment. The being has nothing to do with time, past or future. The being is. And love is. Read the passage in 2 Corinthians 13 about love. And you'll understand what I mean. Replace the word love for the being. And you'll understand what I mean. Mechanical suffering is our life. What we experience in this painful world is really just mechanical suffering, even though sometimes we enjoy it. But that enjoyment is just that brief moment when we're fulfilling a desire. And then that moment passes and we feel empty again. And we want more. We want that desire to be filled again. So we seek new relationships, new movies, new music, new places to live, new friends, new books, a new job. Because those desires are not satisfied. We're very much attached to our own suffering. We love to tell our story. How we've suffered. No one has suffered more than me. And not the way I have. And let me tell you why. We love that. We don't even realize how much we love it. We love how much our parents made us suffer because now we can blame them. We actually love how much our job sucks because we can complain about it. If we couldn't complain, we would be bored, it seems. This kind of suffering is 100% harmful because the longer we remain identified with all these negative emotions that process in our emotional center, we are deepening our suffering. When that envy arises in our heart and we want what this other person has, That's suffering because we're not satisfied. Moreover, we begin to think about it. How can I get what they have? How can I get that car? How can I get that job? How can I become famous? How can I look as pretty as she is? How can I be respected like he is? And we suffer. Then we begin to act on it, even if we don't realize it. Oh, my job is embarrassing compared to that guy. I need a better job. So I can at least be at his level and look like him, and then people will like me. Then we begin to act on it with our motor, instinctive, and sexual brain. That's suffering. Because we're not acting on the will of the being with the intelligence and positive emotions of the being through right action. 
We're acting on negative emotions and wrong thinking and wrong action. And thus we produce karma and we produce more suffering. And worst of all, that desire becomes stronger. It's very simple. If you feed the tiger, he will grow. If you feed the tiger meat, he will get strong. The tiger, in this example, is your own mind. And the more meat and blood and energy you give him, the more dangerous he becomes. And yet we love him. He's cute. He's all we've got. We don't know the being. We only know our anger, our pride, our shame. Our suffering is all we know. And we love that. And the very idea of abandoning it terrifies us. If I abandon my suffering, who will I be? Who am I? It's terrifying to the ego. We have to stop feeding the tiger. We stop feeding the tiger by consciously analyzing and understanding what is processing in the five centers. When that envy arises, we see that, oh, wow, I really feel envious for that that lady. Why? Why should I envy that person? I have my own being. I have my own qualities, my own gifts, my own intelligence inside from him. Why should I admire anyone else for their own ego, for their own things when I have my own? I should respect them, yes. I should treat them properly, yes. There's no need for envy or hate or resentment. They're all lies. In the motor center, we act on those suffering. What we don't understand is that if we want to transform ourselves, really, to overcome suffering, to become free of suffering, we have to sacrifice our suffering. This is not easy. To sacrifice our own suffering becomes conscious or voluntary suffering. And that is the kind of suffering that is meant by the third factor in Gnosis. There are three factors, right? Birth, death, and sacrifice. That sacrifice is referring to sacrificing our own sufferings. Or, in other words, the desires of the ego. To sacrifice the desires of the ego is also a form of suffering. When we give up chocolate, but we love it, it's a kind of suffering. Granted, it's superficial. When we give up the desires of our lust, that is a huge sacrifice. When we renounce the desires of our anger, that is a huge sacrifice. And it's painful. And we suffer. We suffer because part of us is trapped in that ego. And that ego is suffering when we deny it food. Meaning that tiger gets really mad. We used to just feed it whatever it wanted. Anytime. Yeah, sure, you want to use my intellect? Have all the energy you want in my intellectual brain. Here you go. And we feed the tiger. And you just start thinking and thinking and thinking and daydreaming and fantasizing all day long. The tiger wants food through the emotional center. The tiger wants food through the instinct, through the sexual center, through the motor center, and we give it. And we suffer, but we don't care. To stop feeding the tiger starts with renouncing mechanical suffering, which means we activate positive suffering. We begin to sacrifice 
our own egotistical intentions. So when we're criticized, we do not react. When we're blamed, we do not react. When we are accused, we smile. When we are crucified, we kiss the hand of the one who drives the nails into our own hands. We have to receive with gladness all the unpleasantness that our fellow men will give us. That's what Jesus said when he said to turn the other cheek and offer it. That is real sacrifice. It doesn't mean that we simply take abuse for the sake of suffering. It means we renounce the reactions of our own mind as they appear in the five sinners. And we control them with conscious will. How is that conscious will directed? How do you know what to do? How do you know when to act and when not to act? When to speak and when not to speak? To know that, you have to listen not to the mind, not to the intellect, not to the emotion, to the being. And the being will speak through the intellect, through the emotion, with intelligence, with positive emotion, but through the consciousness, not through the mind. That voluntary suffering is what leads us us to stop feeding the tiger, the egos, the eyes. And what happens if you stop feeding them? They begin to die. Slowly and steadily. Now the motor center has many activities. And the Master Samael Anvior explains some of those activities. And they include mechanical imitation. We know that from when we're growing up as children, we imitate our parents, our siblings, our neighbors in order to learn how to behave. And we learn good things and we learn bad things. We continue to imitate now. If you observe yourself, you'll see that very clearly. If you move into a new environment, you will begin to imitate the other people in that environment in order to fit in. You probably won't even be aware of it unless you're really looking. Your vocabulary will change. The words you use, the way you use them, the way you speak, the way you walk, the way you interact, the humor you use, all of those things will be modified because of the motor center. Because the ego, which wants to fit in, that pride wants to be liked and accepted in the group, uses the motor center in order to adapt or imitate the new environment. And there's no real need for that. That's mechanical. The, me- the motor center is also involved with the creation of the self. The creation of the self-image. Now we all have a concept or a, a picture of who we are. And of course, we think a lot of things about ourselves, which are not true. We may think that we're a kind and generous person, patient, loving, compassionate. But we don't see that in truth we're vengeful, rude, critical, arrogant, full of hot air, boastful. That self-image does not include those things, generally speaking. Although here... Nowadays, we find that many people are quite proud to be boastful. And they're quite proud to be angry because we think anger is a virtue. That creation of self-image is made in conjunction with fantasy. (coughs) With mechanical imagination. Also related to the motor center are habits. We have millions of habits. The way we sit, the way we talk, 
the way we brush our teeth, the way we eat, the way we talk on the phone, the way we walk to work, the way we drive the car, millions. And they're all mechanical. We have also in the motor center a necessary muscular tension. How many people are tense right now? Why? Why should there be tension when you're sitting and listening? Yet there is. And that's because something is vibrating in the motor center producing tension. It's unnecessary. And it's a waste of energy. Unconscious movements, like tapping your feet, scratching little itches, changing your posture, unconscious movements. This is related to the motor center, and it has nothing to do with the consciousness. Constantly fiddling with our hair, playing with a button, tapping a pen, they're all unconscious activities of the motor center. Any kind of automatic action in this form. And fifth, another activity of the motor center, the master says, is insubstantial words of ambiguous gossip. Speaking for the sake of speaking. So what he's indicating is this tendency to talk incessantly. To just talk and talk and talk, to gossip, to chatter, to talk about nothing. It's related to the motor center. It's an ego vibrating in the other brains, but using the activities of the motor center to express itself and to fulfill its desire. In some people, it's fear. Some people talk constantly because they're afraid. Some people never talk because they're afraid. The way to manage remember to be present. To remember to be here and now. To be in the body. To be conscious of the body's actions from moment to moment. Each movement we make should be consciously directed, not mechanical. This is difficult to achieve. That self-remembrance is to be aware and present in oneself and also to remember one's being. To know that he's there. That she, he, is there inside with us. And if we really do that, if we really remember ourselves, Why should we ever be afraid? Why should we ever feel lonely? Why should we ever have doubt? To remember oneself means to reject the identification with any of the five centers. It means to be present and transform impressions. Now, we abuse this center in many ways. We do it through violent sports, through repetitive activities. But we can also develop this center in positive ways through different kinds of conscious exercises and practices like meditation with uh, vocalization. And most of all, by relaxing. Relaxation is necessary to self-realize the being. Sounds simple, right? In order to self-realize the being, we have to relax. But we're tense all the time. In the mind and in the body. So we have to start here, learn to relax, and to remember ourselves. In the instinctive center, we have all those qualities of the physical body which are performed automatically for us. 
we have our digestion, we have the circulatory system, we have breathing, we have all kinds of instincts related to self-preservation. In truth, those become conscious activities as well, where the consciousness learns to dominate how instinct is handled and processed. But this is something that takes a great deal of development in order to acquire. But what we can know is, to begin the process of learning that, we work by learning about sensation. We know very well that every ego, every I, is rooted in desire. And every desire is related to sensation. Even our envy to have something is really related to a sensation. But we have to find out how is it related to a sensation. Our craving for certain kinds of situations in life is related to certain kinds of sensations. And our avoidance of certain things in life, like death, is related to certain sensations. To perceive that requires discipline. But inevitably, we find sensation is a vibration of energy and matter. So really, desire is the craving for a particular vibration in energy or matter. So to understand that relationship and to control that requires a great deal of development and discipline. But as I said, we begin that now by observing what kind of sensations we are drawn to and addicted to. We get sensations from TV. We get sensations from certain kinds of food, from certain kinds of people that we interact with. Why? What are the sensations that we're craving and why? Lastly, we'll talk about the sexual center. Now, again, we have positive and negative here, as we have in all the centers. In the sexual center, we have the battle between eros and anteros. Or in other words, lust and chastity. This duality is again expressing the difference between the being and the ego. The being has nothing to do with lust. Can never mix with lust. But the being is the root and force of chastity. Or in other words, sexual energy directed in the right way. All creation occurs through sexuality on every level. And God himself or herself is the implementer and activator of that form of creation. And so in that way, we understand that sexuality has a very positive aspect. At the same time, we see in our lives and in our cultures, sexuality has a very negative aspect also. And that's when that intelligence of Bina is trapped in the ego, trapped in desire. It may sound contradictory to you, but pure sexuality is free of desire. And we don't understand that. All we know is animal desire. But real and true and divine sexuality has no desire. It's pure. To comprehend that requires that we learn how to work with the sexual center in the right way. And this means taking control of the sexual force and directing it towards a positive function. 
We learn how to do this through white tantrism. White tantra. Or in other words, alchemy. And that's the process to harness that divine energy and to use it in the right way. Free of desire. Free of ego. Free of craving. Free of aversion. But used in a natural, spontaneous, and perfect way. Now, regarding this, the Master, Samael Anvior, has said, Each center of the machine should work with its own energy. But unfortunately, the other centers of the machine steal the energy of the sex. When the intellectual, emotional, motor, and instinctive centers work in the wrong way, they steal the energy of the sex, and then sexual abuse exists. Sexual abuse ends when we establish within ourselves a permanent center of gravity. Now, in this sense, in Gnosis, when we say the words sexual abuse, we're not talking about the way we understand that in our materialistic culture. Sexual abuse in Gnosis relates to the abuse of the energies of the sexual center. Now, back to our example of the motor Each of these centers is a different part of the machine. Each one has its own function and its own energy. Each one vibrates in a different way, at a different rate of speed. So the fastest vibration is naturally in the sexual center. It's a very fast vibration. And the slowest is in the intellect. In between, we find the range. What happens, though, is because we become addicted to intellectualism, we exhaust the energy of the intellect. In each given day, we have a certain amount of energy available for us to use. In the teachings of Gurdjieff, these are called Boben Kaldanosts, which I won't even begin to spell. But we call them vital values. Vital because it's energy, and values because it's of a particular measurement. Okay? Whoops. So these vital values are like a certain amount of fuel or energy of particular types. So in an engine, we have gasoline, we have antifreeze, we have oil. We have a lot of different types of energy or fuel or fluids which work in different places for different reasons. In the same way... Each of the five centers has their own form of energy that they require. So, at the beginning of each day, having rested, we have a certain amount of energy available for each of these centers. But when we're addicted to intellectualism, we'll in a couple of hours. But we keep using it. Where is it going to get the energy? to drive it. In every case, we find the centers that become exhausted of their own natural energies steal energy from the sexual center, which is the most potent energy we have. But because the fuel for the sexual center is very high octane, we feed it into the intellectual center, and what happens? We destroy it. The intellectual center becomes disequilibrized or disequilibrated. It's a hard word. Out of balance. Overheated. Overused. Exhausted. And what is the result of doing that day after day after day after day? The machine stops to function properly. And we go crazy. And we wonder why. Wandering around in our big cities, there are so many crazy people. And we wonder. We abuse the emotional center by being addicted to sensations related to the emotional center. We exhaust the vital values that are normally there in a given day. That center becomes empty of fuel, steals additional fuel from the sexual center, and 
destroys itself. The ego, so hungry to feed itself, demands to use the emotional center during the day, to use it too much because of bad habits, and thus, little by little, we begin to destroy the emotional center. That's how we develop potent and difficult emotional problems, which is now normal. Even the materialistic psychologist will tell you the majority of people nowadays suffer emotional problems and mental problems. The majority. It's not a minority. It's not a small number of people that are locked away in some place off in the distance. It's everybody. And the disequilibrium we have in the mind and the heart is because we don't understand how to use these centers in balance. So this same applies to all of the five centers. When we abuse of them, we exhaust their natural energies, and then we abuse the energies of the sexual center, which in turn destroys the human machine. This is what we call disequilibrium. This is a very important term in Gnosis. Because as we know from previous lectures, in order for us to acquire the creation of the solar bodies, or in other words, the soul, we have to move out of being one of the three inferior types of personality. And those inferior types of personality are the intellectual type of person, the emotional type of person, who habitually is using the emotional center all the time, and the motor instinctive sexual type of person who's abusing that brain. Each of those three people, three types of persons, are the Tower of Babel, which we know from previous lectures. Each one of them is in disequilibrium because they're abusing one aspect more than the others, not developing in balance. In order to transcend that and to achieve the creation of the soul, we have to become the fourth type of person. And that person is equilibriated. We must have psychological equilibrium. Psychological equilibrium is what we achieve when we know how to manage the five centers consciously. It does not mean that we've eliminated the ego. It does not mean that we're perfect. It means the person who's achieved psychological equilibrium knows how to observe themselves, knows how to remember themselves, and knows to always apply conscious control over the five centers as best they can. They're still asleep. They still make mistakes. They still have ego. They still suffer. But they're learning. And that learning is, again, balancing these centers in order to be in equilibrium. That is something that's defined from moment to moment. And it is achieved through great emotional crises. Why? Why do we have great emotional crises in Gnosis? Why is that important? We need to boil the water in order to remove the impurities. That's alchemy. You have to boil the metals to heat them in order for all the impure things to come out in order to purify that entity. The same is true of our own psychology. We apply heat to the human machine through ordeals, through difficult situations, by being presented with contradictions. By that, we become defined. And what I mean by defined is we reach equilibrium or we don't. And if we don't, we achieve nothing. We keep feeding the ego. What that means is we face a painful situation or a difficult situation. 
we have to respond. If we learn how to observe ourselves and remember ourselves, we learn how to manage the five centers consciously, then we know how to respond responsibly, consciously, to the best of our ability, without reacting mechanically. Through that, we have comprehension. Comprehension is the understanding of our own psyche. And when we have that comprehension, that water has boiled out the impurities. And so we pass through that crisis a better person. In alchemy, the the traditional symbolism is to take an impure metal and to cook it in order to extract the impurities. And that's why it's so perfect as an analogy for this teaching. That's why those ancient alchemists who were trying to transmit this gnosis used that idea as a vehicle, as a symbol. Of course, the common people misunderstood and thought they literally meant, let's go take lead and make it into gold. It's not the real meaning. That lead is the ego. That lead is our own mind. And the gold is the being. By applying heat to the five centers, by facing difficult problems, painful circumstances, seemingly insurmountable issues, we define ourselves. We define what in us is impure and what in us is pure. And let's make the difference and choose which one we really want. It's astonishing to observe spiritual students, Gnostic students, students of any tradition, who face difficult situations and yet become identified who face circumstances that are there just for their benefit, but yet cause the ego to react in a very powerful way. For example, the leader of a movement will suddenly find himself in a situation that totally contradicts, on the surface, what he's been teaching. And then all the students are in shock. And they forget that is for their benefit. For them to understand their own mind. How they've become attached to that leader or dependent upon that leader. Or they project their own ideals upon that person who's just a man or a woman. But when that reality arises, that circumstance which is painful It contradicts that ideal. The student suffers. And if the student does not remain in self-remembering, meaning remaining in equilibrium, they will become identified with the... and never come back. In fact, they will become its enemy and they will hate it. And the reason is They love their idea, meaning they're trapped in time. They're trapped in a structure in their own mind, and they don't perceive the reality of the facts. This is so common as to be lamentable. All students of Gnosis where nothing is as it seems. When we walk this path, we walk a path of initiation, which is a path of being tested constantly. And the tests are for our own good. The tests are given by our own being. As and we all fail because we love our desires too much. 
We all fail. Those who persist will face the ordeals again and again and again until they get it. Others give up and walk away. And that's their right. So to be sincere in Gnosis is to be very honest and to not have a contradiction between how we act and talk and what we feel. If we speak of Gnosis, if we want to be a serious student, if we want to really know who the being is, we have to act that way. What I'm saying is we need to have equilibrium in the five centers. In order to have real individuality, we have to have the five centers in union, unified under one will, which is conscious. And a real ordeal, a really good ordeal, will make us have contradiction in all the five centers. So when we see that, then we know, here's my chance to prove myself. There's pain in that. That pain is that positive suffering. So long as we are renouncing ourselves. Now, in practical terms, this is one of the most difficult things we can ever do. Because it means when we face contradiction, when we face suffering in life, we have to go against our own ideas. We have to go against our very own point of view. Our egotistical point of view. Our conceptual point of view. Our emotional point of view. Our mechanical point of view. And that can be a Gnostic point of view. Very easily. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.